So, welcome uh, to a time of ethics in quarantine. This is a very impromptu thing. I thought I'd grab my colleagues. Uh, uh, this is a uh, wonderful Dr. Pat McCarty, who's an expert in medical ethics, and Dr. Patrick Smith. Uh, we're all colleagues here at Duke Divinity School. And we thought we'd just have a quick conversation for some broader frameworks, how we think about ethics in a time of COVID-19 and some of what's going on, some broader frameworks, implications for the medical system and uh, for churches uh, more generally. So I'm going to say some uh, opening reflections and then invite my colleagues in. Um, so one of the things we've obviously been hearing a lot about is the question of social distancing. And that seems to cut against a lot of how we understand uh, ethical relations, particularly within a Christian framework of love thy neighbor, when we want to reach out to feed, to touch, to be with, to show solidarity with. And so advocacy of social distancing feels like something that cuts against very deep Christian commitments and, and even just our normal sensibilities as social animals. Evolutionary biologists talk about us being ultra-social animals. And one of the ways to think about this from a kind of highly philosophical frame of reference, it comes from Soren Kierkegaard, who, as you know, was a um, thinker from the 18th century, uh, roughly. Um, and uh, uh, he had this idea that on certain occasions, and he was thinking particularly around the story of Abraham and Isaac, that certain ethical norms have to be suspended and in that moment of suspension, it leads to a kind of re-evaluation or rethinking or recalibration of our accepted norms. Not that we get rid of ethics, but that certain kind of events or crises or, or moments force us to rethink. And I think COVID-19 is one of those kinds of moments. And so how I tend to think about this, and I've been seeing what um, you think, is whether we're in that kind of Kierkegaardian moment of the suspension of the ethical that leads us then to rethink some of those instinctive, intuitive sense of I've got to reach out and touch or pro to provide comfort. And social distancing comes in at that point where actually that is the moral thing to do, even though it feels immoral somehow in that moment. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, just some of the further background. I mean, some of our deepest impulses to care unconditionally for the person right in front of us when they're ill um, our, our kind of Christian legacy uh, from St. Basil of Caesarea in the 4th century, founded the first hospital uh, with trained medical practitioners open to all, and the way, especially in the West, uh, healthcare has been committed to care unconditionally and not turn away from someone is because of that legacy uh, flowing from Jesus' words in Matthew 25. And St. Basil founded that in response to famine and plague. Um, and so we're at a moment where our healthcare practitioners are still going to be honoring that commitment and our healthcare institutions will be, but the felt sense that all of us should be doing that actually, as you were indicating, social distancing means we might, love of neighbor might mean distancing from neighbor at this time. And so that's a, that's a real tension because the challenges we'll face as non-healthcare practitioners are going to be felt challenges very different from the ones healthcare practitioners will be feeling. And I think that, that sense in which we, it can lead, the moment of suspension can lead to a reimagination of our moral sensibility. So it's not that we uh, uh, necessarily don't reach out, but social distancing is one practice of care. Mm -hmm. And we might say that social accompaniment, I'm not saying kind of going in and, and feeding people, but, it, but the sense of social accompaniment, how will we make present make ourselves present to others, uh, or particularly those who are less at risk, like the young, can make themselves present, being accompanying with those who are shut in, or those who are isolated, or those who are quarantined, in kind of non-contact, non-intimate way. So the sense in which you're being accompanied in your isolation, you're not forgotten, you're still uh, a human who people recognize and know and respect. How do we need, how, there's a sense in which we've got to reimagine the moment of suspension calls for reimagining how do you uh, uh, communicate love and respect uh, through modes of social accompaniment that incorporate social distancing. And I think this is what's so important about this notion of reimagining, right? And some, you know, might be concerned about suspending, right, the ethical, but, uh, and another way of reframing the same idea is just what does it mean to reimagine the application of this love ethic, right? So what does it mean to love 
uh, neighbor in light of COVID-19, right? And is social distancing because of what we know in terms of public health and the way uh, infectious disease are passed and the uh, negative and deleterious implications of those, right, helps us to reimagine what love actually looks like. And one of the advantages I think that we have uh, in the context in which we live, and it's one of those questions I think we have to uh, ask, uh, is the role that technology uh, plays in, in terms of keeping us uh, connected, even if it's not in an ideal situation, because we find ourselves in, in less than ideal circumstances to begin with, I think uh, creatively navigating those spaces becomes uh, really important, especially as we are committed to some type of um, uh, reflect deeply on you know, the incarnation of Jesus, this deep embodied encompassment community uh, aspect of the way we think about your life. Do you, think, do you think there's a concern... One of the problems, obviously, in the kind of ethics of technology is that technology can distance us. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously, we've seen a lot of stuff around social media, um, kind of exacerbating or, or, or uh, uh, diminishing our ability to be a political community together through misinformation, through um, fake news and this kind of stuff. Here we're faced with a moment when we're turning to Zoom, we're turning to these uh, forms of, of, uh, of technology to kind of mediate relationship. Is there any downside to that? Is there a sense in which, uh, is there the broader ethical question of not making the best, uh, the good, the enemy of the best? Is it whether they're imperfect, they're not great, um, it would be better if we could meet face to face, but the reconciling ethical demands of social distancing accompanying and social accompaniment and achieving that through technology sometimes we do have to go for the imperfect to reach the good, even though it's not the best, as it were. But right. No, I mean that seems exactly right. I've been transferring a lot of my meetings to Zoom, and uh, and I'm grateful for the technology making that possible. Colleagues teaching. I mean, it's uh, incredibly helpful. But one thing I want to flag about the imperfectness of technology is the levels of access available to it. Right. So I, I'm grateful to have a job that can largely work remotely. Um, there are a lot of folks who don't. Uh, um, what does that mean in terms of uh, equity and employment and income? Um, and also, uh, some of the folks most at risk uh, of, of serious complications from COVID-19, the elderly and pre-existing health conditions, folks who might not be the best at accessing technology. So, you know, DoorDash and these other things have, like, leave at door, no contact delivery, which is wonderful, grateful for that. But... Uh, my grandma could not operate that. I'll just put it that way. Um, and so what might social accompaniment look like for those most uh, at risk might mean being their DoorDash or being, you know, ability to take food and grocery, some medical supplies um, in ways that are appropriately uh, moderate and, you know, attentive to and mitigating risk factors around hand washing and presence. Yeah. But still, technology is a great gift, imperfect as it is, but not accessible to all. So yeah. I think that's... a, a what we're pressed to attend to. Okay. And, that, so, I was, I was say, and this becomes extremely important in terms of any plans that we're developing going forward, always asking the question, what does this mean for those who uh, don't have as much access uh, to these technological um, uh, uh, technological advances uh, that can facilitate community, uh, but then also just uh, continue their way of life. I just got a call uh, just a couple days ago uh, from a gentleman who's working at a church uh, out west in their congregation. They were thinking about creative ways of attending to just these kinds of questions, right? What do we do for people in our community and our churches? How can those of us who uh, are maybe relatively healthy, younger, don't have these underlying health conditions, how can we stand in the gap yeah. uh, for those people in our community? And so one of the things we talked about was making sure that there's conversation with public health professionals uh, and others about how they can actually be the hands and the feet of Jesus during this time. Uh, so in that sense, a broad sense of technology uh, in terms of how that could uh, be generated right. to deal with the those on the margins, at least these. One of the things we're looking at in the ethics class is kind of running through, and it runs through uh, particularly modern American Christian ethics conversations, is the kind of love and justice theme. You've done a lot of work around health, health equity, particularly with minoritized communities. Can you see any particular stress points um, more broadly uh, coming out of that work that, that COVID-19 presses upon? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Whenever you start thinking about uh, social distancing with particular types of employment, uh, those who uh, are responsible uh, for keeping facilities clean to minimize, you know, infection and so on and so forth, uh, that. I mean, I mean, uh, those staffs do the work that keep us healthy in so many different ways. And so when you uh, shut down organizations, when you shut down institutions, uh, and people's livelihood is dependent upon doing that work, the challenge becomes, well, I'm going to maybe take chances that I otherwise would not take if I need to get income. So, yes, it's fine to say, don't go out, don't do this, but if I have to figure out a way to work to generate income so I can eat, what good is it going to do me, yeah. right, being, you know, self-quarantined yeah. or social distancing if I can't eat, yeah. right, if I can't pay my bills, yeah. or if the power bill uh, can't, you know, stay on in order for me to be able to access right. internet, or I can't pay my, you know, cable and phone bill and so on and so right. forth, right? Yeah. And so I think these are the kind of larger questions, which requires uh, a broader set of resources to come to bear yeah. on dealing with these particular right. issues. I think that's really important. So the question of the the questions of, if we think about social distancing as a kind of commutative justice issue, what do I owe, what's the kind of just act in terms of to my neighbor, this is broader questions of distributive justice. How does society need to recalibrate the whole to enable those who are the least, the lost and the last, who are most marginalized already where they're going to suffer the brunt, particularly the economic impact, Absolutely. Um, kind of raises broader questions. Absolutely. Brett, can I just turn to you, um, I think, just give some thoughts around the hospital, mm -hmm. and, and you've done some interesting work around the hospital as a site of moral formation, yeah. particularly things like um, uh, uh, ICU units, but the... Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, the emergency unit mm -hmm. triaging questions, that's yeah. going to be pressed very hard yeah. in the coming weeks. So just give a few reflections on that. No, I mean, institutions are going to have to think really hard about how do you, if the curve goes a certain way, how do you use scarce resources? And so uh, rather than kind of unconditionally committing all available resources to one patient, we're going to have to start triaging. They'll, the institutions will, which will lead to not being able to care for people that just weeks before you would provide amazing care to. And in terms of formation, I mean, the folks who are used to providing this amazing wealth of health care availabilities that we have, though, you know, disproportionately distributed along income lines and insurance availability, but still uh, not being able to provide that kind of care uh, because of triage is going to feel really jarring and a lot of lament will be present. and. It's going to be a lot of pain that they see uh, and in some ways feel like they're inflicting by their absence of care. And so how to walk with healthcare practitioners that we know and, and hold their lament with us. At the same time, um, what might it mean if a 80-year-old you know, person is triaged and, and, and basically not uh, given care? How might others walk alongside them and accompany them, particularly if we're thinking toward a moment where our healthcare system is overwhelmed? And that's where... Uh, the ethics underlying what might look like social distancing now, we might need to rethink right. um, in, say, two weeks or so. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it's just to close that sense of uh, when we began with the suspension, I think times of kind of moral intensity that I think that we're, we're, we're in a moment when really basic questions are in play, that sense of a kind of spirit-inspired practical reasoning that is attentive to what's going on with these people in this time at this moment and how we do need to be morally alert. It's not just the kind of health and safety factors, but these are deep moral questions throwing up for people we love and care for or have pastoral responsibilities for. And But that actually does need to change and be attentive in a sense. Our, our, our moral antennae need to tune in and be changed. So, Thank you so much for this opportunity. If, if, if we have further opportunity to do this, I think it would be good to have further conversation. Yeah, I just want to say in yeah. closing, just to find one point that uh, Dr. McCarty raised that was so important, that is disciples of Christ, right? It may come a point down the road uh, that we put ourselves in harm's way, right? Do it as wise as we possibly can, but it might mean putting ourselves in harm's way to best serve and love our neighbor. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much, indeed. Thanks, Beth. Bye.